So one of the questions that we often hear from skeptics and even from Christians is, why do bad things happen to good people? How could a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, ever since sin entered the world, the world is now full of pain and suffering. Sometimes the pain and suffering we receive is consequence of our own sin. And, and those are the times that we really shouldn't question it at all. But there are other times when we have pain and suffering due to the consequences of other people's sin. And that's pretty unfortunate. But the Lord is sovereign. And he knows everything that has happened and will happen to you. And this can be comforting, but it also can be painful as well to know that God knows. If God knows, then why? Why? But as finite human beings, we are not all knowing. We are not all seeing. We are not all understanding. We're not aware of all the reasons the Lord allows things in our lives. And and from this side of heaven, can I just tell you, this is something that you will struggle with your entire Christian walk. And and many times we talk about surrendering to the Holy Spirit, right? You've heard that so many times. Surrender to the control of the Holy Spirit. Once we're in Christ... The Holy Spirit has promised to come and indwell us as believers. So when we're controlled by, filled with, and surrendering to the Holy Spirit, we can walk in wisdom, making the most of every opportunity because Jesus lives inside of us. But yet, bad things sometimes still happen. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark as we continue in that verse-by-verse study of that Gospel Last week we began the Gospel of Mark and we learned that Mark presents Jesus as the suffering servant Messiah King. That's a mouthful, right? He's the suffering servant King. How can that be? John the Baptist came on the scene and his message was for the people of Israel, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus went through John's baptism to identify with man Not because he needed to repent, but because his mission was to do the will of the Father and identify with and save sinful man. We ended talking about servant leadership, which again is contrary to the ways of the world. Servant leadership. Servant leadership aims to develop those who are underneath them, serving as an example instead of tyrants. Someone who leads the way to those who are under their authority in the way they should go. But as we obediently follow the Lord and we try to remain in his will, we find out that he's got a plan for our life, even a plan for a desert time. And we're going to see that in scripture today. God sends us into deserts sometimes. And that's mind-boggling and sometimes hard to accept. So today we're going to discover that being obedient to the Lord doesn't always mean life's going to be easy. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, Satan tempts Jesus. If your Bibles are open, Mark chapter one, let's begin with verse 12. Notice the first word, immediately. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with wild beasts and catch this, and the angels ministered to him. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke give a lot more details on what temptation looked like for Jesus during the 40 days there in the desert. But both of them say that the Spirit led Jesus into the desert. Here Mark says the Spirit drove him into the desert. Just like Jesus having to be baptized with the baptism of repentance to identify with man was a head scratcher, this can be a head scratcher too. Why did the perfect Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, get driven into a desert? And there's a message here for us. The Spirit drove, catch this, according to Strong's means to cast out, to drive out, or to send out. So the Spirit casted him out, drove him out, and sent him out. And notice what it says, immediately. Back in the time frame, immediately after the baptism of Jesus, where the father declared, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, a boy, Jesus. 
desert experience. Doesn't that seem a little contrary? Sidney Page, the author of Satan, God's Servant, said this. The word immediately there in verse 12 connects the temptation directly with the baptism. There in your notes, the same spirit that came on Jesus at his baptism now impelled or drove him into the wilderness for testing. If you've ever attended a baptism here at Living Faith, you've probably heard us say the words, now let's all pray for this person, because anytime you make a stand or a proclamation for the Lord Jesus Christ publicly, the attacks are going to happen. And here we see it in the life of Jesus. He went through, obediently went through John's baptism, and immediately after God the Father says, this is my son and I'm well pleased, desert experience. How many of us have been through a mountaintop experience only to turn around right after that joyous time? Desert. Trials. Am I the only one? Some people make the mistake, and, and this is where their faith can be shaken quite a bit, they make the mistake of thinking, if I obediently follow the Lord, I obey Him in everything, and I'm following His will for my life, I will never be tempted at all. Life will be easy. Life will be good. No attacks are going to happen. But here we see the Father sent Jesus out to the desert. In the Bible, desert is often described as the opposite of the paradise of the Garden of Eden, right? And it's a harsh place that cannot sustain life. Jesus, at his baptism, accepted a call. Maybe you remember from last week. We learned that he accepted the call as the Messiah, the suffering servant king. He accepted it. He identified with sinful man. But now, he's experiencing some consequences from accepting that call. Can I just tell you, if you accept a call from the Lord, get ready. Attacks will come. Uh, it's unfortunate. Blessings, yes. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. But attacks as well. Because, understand this, our enemy does not attack dead things. If you're doing something for forward motion with the Lord, you will be attacked. But catch this there in your notes. This does not mean that Jesus was forced unwillingly into the wilderness, but he willingly went where the Spirit led him. 1 John 3.8 says this, gives us the purpose for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, that's why Jesus was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. And since Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, he needed, he had to go into the desert and overcome Satan. He had to, to show us how to do it. It's amazing to me that at his baptism, again, where God the Father gives him the attaboy and says, this is my son, I'm well pleased and all that. Jesus didn't sit around and kind of gloat in the glory, right? Oh, I just had heaven open up and the words of God spoken. And Jesus said, what a good time to take a vacation. No, he didn't. Right after those affirming words, he gets driven out to the desert to be tested for 40 days. The word tempted in verse 13 means, catch this, to try, to make trial of, to test, for the purpose of ascertaining his quality of what he thinks or how he will behave. I beat myself up sometimes because you go through these mountaintop experiences and sure as sugar, that happens. The rug gets pulled out from underneath you and you have a trial, whether it's a person, a neighbor, the dog, whatever. You have a trial right after this mountaintop experience where you say, Lord, I love you. You're so good to me. I will serve you all the days of my life. And then your neighbor knocks on your door and he gets kind of nasty with you and you instantly return evil for evil. You shut the door and you go, oh my gosh. I cannot believe I did that. Again, maybe just me, I guess so. Thomas Constable said, the Greek word for tempted means to put someone or something through a trial to demonstrate its character. God allowed Satan to tempt Jesus for two reasons. Catch this. 
to show that he would not draw away from the Father's will, and to demonstrate his qualification for the mission. For the mission. You know, many of us, we get saved, and the first thing we want to do is we want to run out on the mission field and have the, you know, the highest of high calling. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, no, 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 time out. we got to put you through some testing first. And it's not so he can know, it's so you can know. But before we move on real quick, there are some interesting types from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfills here. Think about these. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their sin and disobedience. Jesus overcame Satan in 40 days in the desert. Joshua led the people of Israel into the promised land. Jesus, which is the Greek name for Joshua, by the way, grants us eternal life. The third one, Adam sinned in the garden and brought sin into the world. But Jesus, the second Adam, overcame Satan and temptation in that desert and gives us eternal life. Now for a promise. Notice verse 13. And the angels ministered to him. The angelic servants of heaven came to minister, came to serve Jesus during this time of testing. Even though Jesus was called out, driven out into the desert, the Father did not leave him nor forsake him. Instead, he provided for all his needs through the angels. This fulfills a psalm. Psalm 91 is a messianic psalm written over 800 years before Jesus walked the face of the earth. And this is what it said. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. It's repeated again in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 uh, about the promise to protect the baby Jesus. But the father also kept that promise during this testing period. And it's so cool. Now, that's all wonderful. You know the history. You know that he did that for Jesus. Of course the father provided for Jesus. How about me? Man, I'm glad you asked. For us followers this morning, we can stand on that promise as well. Listen, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Well, how do I know that's for me? Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says to us. Remember, the writer of Hebrews was writing to Christians who were downcast and they're under persecution. And this is what he said. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who would inherit salvation? Is not that their call to come to minister to us? The Lord has set his angels over us as well. No matter what you're going through in life and hear me. I've had the loss of parents and the loss of children and the loss of finances. I'm not trying to make light of your trials and your hardships. Been there, done that. So I'm not trying to make light of your trials, but know this, that no matter what you're going through this morning, no matter what it is, the Lord will protect you and he will never, ever, ever leave you. Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, went through the desert temptation to show us how to make it. He was approved by the Father, led by the Spirit, and served by angels. Now, when we go through persecution, we go through a trial, we can be encouraged by that same passage. Matthew Henry said this, whatever happens, nothing shall hurt the believer. Though trouble and affliction befall, it shall come not for his hurt, but for his good. Though for the present it's not joyous but grievous, his promise is that he will in due time deliver the believer out of trouble and in the meantime be with you in the trouble. Have you looked around? I'm in trouble. Look around. He's there in the fire with you. He hasn't left you. Again, the writer of Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Anne Spangler said this, As human beings whose hearts are roiled with the strife that sin brings, we no longer live in Eden, where perfect peace reigns, there in your notes, thrust into the wilderness, 
We are not abandoned there, but led by the Spirit to learn the lessons, catch this, that only the desert can teach you. Why did God allow it? Because there's some lessons that only that situation can teach you. God's got a plan. So let's move on and and see this lived out. John imprisoned. Look at verse 14. Just the first part. Now, after John was put in prison, it's kind of ironic that the Gospel of Mark doesn't touch on how he got arrested or why he got arrested, and the other Gospels do. The Gospel of Matthew gives a more detailed account of exactly how John ended up in prison. Now, before we get there, again, think about who this is. We learned about him last week. He was the forerunner. One's coming who's going to cry out as the, as the one in the wilderness to get your hearts ready to meet Messiah. This is John. He's called by the Lord. So surely his life ought to be easy, without pain, without sorrow. Matthew 14, 3. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Okay, so Herod gets together with his sister-in-law. He marries her. John says that sin. And wouldn't you know it, King Herod doesn't like the sound of that. Throws him in prison. Surely not. God, I served you with my whole heart. And I end up in prison because I did what you told me to do? You told me to go preach repentance? I told this guy to repent and he threw me in prison. How could you, God? None of us would ever ask that question, right? There in your notes, John was arrested because Herod ordered it following John's criticism of Herod's marriage to his brother's wife, Herodias. But what happened while he was in prison? I'm sure at the time... When John first got thrown in the clink, he could not see the whole picture of what's going on. Maybe he's even a little sorry for himself. But while John was out of circulation, his followers were still able to get word to him and actually take word from him back to Jesus. Scholars believe that John the Baptist was actually in prison for about 10 months. So this wasn't like a weekend stay. At Herod's birthday party, Herod's stepdaughter, Solomay, danced provocatively for her stepdad. It was so provocative, and he was so turned on by it, that he told his stepdaughter, I'll give you anything you want in all the kingdom. What would you like for that? Herodias instructed her daughter to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And that's exactly what she asked for. Matthew 14, 9. The king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mama. I wonder, I wonder what John was thinking. Back up to John chapter 3. And John the Baptist says these words. Listen carefully to these words, because we've probably said it once or twice ourselves. In John 3.30, he said, He must increase. I must decrease. Remember when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when his followers were standing there, he said, Hey, he's got to increase. I've got to decrease. It's all about Jesus, folks. It's not about me. I wonder if John realized exactly what those words were going to do for him. How many of us have said things like that? He must increase in my life, and I must decrease in my life. And then something bad happens, and we go, why, God? Because I'm increasing in your life. As Christians, there are a lot of times we're so short-sighted. You know, my son Mitch used to watch Barney. He's 30, so you can just go back 27 years ago. He's watching Barney, and one day he lost his dirder. And I said, you lost your what? And it took like three days to figure out what a dirder was. (laughs) He kept saying, Dad, I lost my dirder, my dirder, my dirder. And finally, Barney came on, and it was (laughs) dirder. What his dirder was was an empty toilet paper holder. That was his dirder. We use dirters to look at the world. 
We look at the world through dirters, <laughs> to quote Mitchell. That's what we see. And when something happens, we see this. God sees this, and we don't know what's going on. And so we say words like, he must increase, I must decrease. And then it hits the fan, and we say, oh, no. Isaiah 55, 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And again, I'm not trying to discount your trials or the sufferings you've had in your life. I mean, in this world, there are some hardships. They happen. John the Baptist had a ministry to preach repentance. And that's what he did to Herod. He told him, you're in sin. Repent. And Herod throws him in jail. There in your notes, the thanks John the Baptist received for being obedient to the Lord was to be killed. If we fail to understand that God has a plan during trials and desert experiences, it can shipwreck us in our faith. But as believers, there's a couple things you got to know. you got to know. Number one there in your notes, the Lord is sovereign. The Lord is sovereign. God's sovereignty simply means that he is God. He's got lordship over everything. He is God, we are not. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's outside of time and space. He knows the future before it happens. So when he says, I'm going to work all things out together for good, sometimes it doesn't feel that good, but he is the creator and he knows all things. His will, his purpose, his plan, and his decree will come to pass. No one or nothing can thwart the Lord. But the second one is more important. The Lord is true to his promises. First, we trust and know that he's sovereign. And then we know that he's faithful to keep his promises. And there's nothing that he cannot do. Maybe you're like me and I can't even begin to count the times where I wanted to serve God as an advisor and tell God how I wanted him to do something. You know, God, it'd be really cool. Let me tell you how you could work this. You could make this and this and this and this happen and this. And then it doesn't go my way at all. And in the moment... I'm upset that I didn't get my own way. I get down the road a piece, and I look back and I go, oh, like Garth Brooks. Lord, I thank God for unanswered prayers, right? I thank God for that. It seems unjust that John the Baptist would be killed for being obedient. I mean, to me, right, looking at the story, how unjust is it that God allowed John the Baptist to be killed? After all, all he did was what he was told to do. If you ask John this morning, if we could like bat phone it to heaven. Hey, John, how's it going up there? What's it look like? Hey, by the way, would you like to change anything that happened? No way. Listen to what John, the Apostle John said in Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. John did not love his physical life because he was a true follower and he was promised eternal life in Christ. And check this out. To end this point, what was Jesus doing at this time? Well, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus began his Galilean ministry right here, the first major phase of his public ministry, but it can only start when? After the forerunner, John the Baptist, was forced into prison and forced to stop his ministry. You get that? John now looks back at time and says, had my ministry kept going, Jesus' couldn't start. He must increase. I must decrease. And that's why John would look from heaven now and say, I wouldn't change a thing. So, kingdom purposes, number three there in your notes. Again, verse 14. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, at this time, most of the Jews were wanting to preach Israeli nationalism. Nationalism! Our country! Defeat the Romans! Get them out of here! 
Here's our king, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, gospel, I need to die, not conquer Rome. And they're not understanding. Instead of your plan of insurrection against Rome, I'm going to the cross. Wow, really? But notice there's two proclamations here, and then there's two directives. You want to know what's in it for you this morning? Great. I'm glad you asked that too. First, the proclamations. Number one there in your notes, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. What's he referring to? Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So the time is fulfilled. The promised Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, came and visited the earth. Number two, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, the Messianic age will be completely fulfilled in the millennial kingdom after the seven-year tribulation. However, the time of Messiah that was predicted all throughout the Old Testament started with Jesus arriving on the scene. Isaiah, again, 800 years before Christ walked the face of the earth, said this, Behold my servant, whom I have upheld, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice and truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. So there you go. Time is at hand. Kingdom of God's at hand. Now, here's the two directives. Ready? Number three, repent. We learned about this last week in John's message. Repent is, it's very simple. It means a U-turn. We agree with God about our sin. We call it sin. He calls it sin. We turn from our sin. We turn around and chase after God. Instead of chasing our sin, we chase God. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is one of those misunderstood passages in the New Testament. Confess. So who am I to confess to? Am I to confess to some guy in a box? Am I to confess to you? Who am I to confess to? It's an unfortunate translation because in the Greek, confession in 1 John 1, 9 literally means to agree with God. It means to agree with God. It's like this. God calls that behavior sin. I agree. I call it sin. Who gets to call what sin? How legalistic are you? How mean are you to call that behavior sin? Repentance is very simple. God calls it sin. I call it sin. The Lord already knows everything about me. When I came to God for the very first time as a 15 and a half year old wrecked young man, and I came to God and I said, Lord, forgive me. He didn't say, okay, Rich, list the sins. I had 15 years, and it was a rough 15 years. He didn't ask me what sin. What he said was, you've been living for self. Rich, are you confessing that what I call sin, you call sin, and you're receiving the free gift of salvation? Yes, I am. The Lord calls my sinful behavior sin. I agree with him. That's what it means if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive them. So there's the first one. Confession, repent. Number four there in your notes. And then believe in the gospel. Here again, this word, it's, it's kind of a weak translation. To believe in the Greek is an action word. 
It, it means to think something's true, to be persuaded that something's true, to credit something, or to put confidence in. It actually means to put your full weight on something. But belief, there in your notes, is not a passive word. If you truly believe in something, you will act on it. Biblical belief is a commitment to the person of Jesus Christ because he is who he said he is and you agree to follow. R. Kent Hughes put it this way. If you say you believe, but there are no substantial changes in your life, you'd better consider carefully whether you truly believe. So we place our confidence, our full trust, our full weight of our trust in the gospel. The gospel, the good news. Jesus came from heaven to earth as a baby to grow up, take the cross in our place, rise again on the third day, and by trusting and putting confidence in that, you will have life in his name. So Jesus asked for a double response here. Repent and believe. But really... It's a one-step response. Let me explain that to you. It involves two steps simultaneously. Repenting means turning from something, but believe means running towards something. So really, it's one step. Let me tell you the 10 steps to a beautiful life. Don't buy the book. Let me tell you the one step to a beautiful life. Die to yourself and run to Jesus. Repenting. Turning from running to God. So let's conclude. So again, why do bad things happen to good people? Why, God? Being obedient to the Lord doesn't always mean that life's going to be easy or life's going to go your way. In fact, quite the opposite. I think this isn't one of those messages that, you know, the seeker-friendly church would just say, hey, just believe in Jesus and everything's going to be fine. That's a lie. It's a lie. I don't want you to come to me six months later and say, you lied to me. We live in a fallen world because sin entered the world. There's real pain. There's real hurt. There's real trials that go on. But the Lord will use all those things for several reasons in your life. And this is how we're going to end. Why and what does Jesus do with those trials? Why does Jesus allow trials in my life? First there in your notes. The Lord allows trials in our lives to mature us spiritually. Here's the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. You can know all the scripture and all the promises of God perfectly, but they're not fully known by you until you're forced to rely on them. I can know that God said he'll never leave me or never forsake me, but at the death of a parent, it becomes true when you have no one else to run to. That promise becomes true. Think about this there in your notes. In Genesis chapter 22, the Lord told Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. And catch this. This wasn't so much to produce faith in him, because God knows the future, as it was a test to show Abraham he had faith. God already knew what Abraham would do. So when he told Abraham to do it, he wanted Abraham to know. You know what? I really do trust the Lord. Wow. The Lord knows before the trial occurs. And he knows whether or not we'll stand in our faith. But he also knows that, like you, I need to be reassured at times. And so as I rely on him, it builds me up and it makes me more mature in my faith. Second one. The Lord allows trials in our lives to strengthen us. So I studied church history in Bible college, and all throughout church history, we have an ugly history, by the way, folks. Church history is disgusting. But the church was only on fire when it was under severe persecution. Every time that they had a little bit of ease, they backslid. It was the persecution that drove them to God and set that church on fire. Without adversity, the church was apathetic. You see, here's why. My human nature reverts back to reliance on self. I'm a fixer. I like to fix things for people. And, and so I think I can fix things for myself. And it's only when God gives me something way too big for me to handle that I have to press into him. 
All right, next, the Lord allows trials in our lives to prove himself faithful. If you never went through a trial, how would you know that God's true to his word? You could say it all day long, but if you never went through a trial, how would you know? Again, Romans 8, 28 from our communion. We know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is in control. There are no accidents, and he is faithful. Next, the Lord's purpose for us during trials is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, we look at the here and now, we don't see the big picture again, it's that dirter, you know. I mean, we're looking through Mitchell's dirter and we just don't see the big pictures. And trials and sufferings can prepare us for something. You want to be great in the kingdom? Jesus says you've got to be servant of all. That's true. But if you want to be great in the kingdom, you need some preparation. And you know what the preparation looks like? It looks like 40 grit sandpaper. God's got to shave some of those rough spots off your life to prepare you for his kingdom. And maybe God's getting you ready for something great. We don't think that way, right? We think negatively. How could you let this happen? I'm preparing you, child. I'm preparing you. Think about Joseph. Here's poor Joseph. He's righteous, did nothing wrong. He's thrown into a pit. Then he's thrown into prison, sold as a slave, all these different things. And at the end of his life, in Genesis chapter 50, he said, what they meant for evil, God turned around and used for good to save many people alive. Had God not thrown Joseph into some pits, into some prisons, he couldn't have done what he did. Part of trusting the Lord, the main part, is trusting him during the trials and the suffering. God is going to use those to transform you. And sometimes God is glorified when he removes the problem. And I love when he does that. He just removes the problem. We didn't see any way out and God removes the problem. And we go, whoo, God's glorified. But you know what? God's also glorified when he allows the trial in your life and you learn to worship him through the trial. That's when your faith will stand. Sometimes, though, we're allowed to go through these trials to help someone else. You ever have that happen? Someone comes to you and they say, you know, here's what I'm going through and all this. And you go, you know, I've walked the road you're walking on. I've been there. Let me tell you how I had to trust in the Lord to see me through that divorce or see me through that bankruptcy or see me through that whatever. Sometimes God allows that in your life so you can go help somebody else. You comfort people with the comfort you were comforted with. Whatever you're going through, God is there with you. And he's going to give you what you need. Maybe not what you want, but he's going to give you what you need. And he allows us finally to go through desert places. And test me on this one. He allows desert places sometimes so that we can really be thankful on the mountaintops. You know, sometimes we go through those deserts. And then we go through a mountaintop and we're like... I'm so much more thankful for mountaintops after I've been through a few of these deserts. But you're not alone. God has never left you. He's not going to forsake you. If you're his child, he has promised he's there with you. He will send you what you need. And sometimes he sends us what we need in another person. Sometimes it just happens. We don't know. But God's going to work it all out. He promised and he is so faithful. I've walked this earth long enough, lost enough, gained enough to know that God never, ever fails. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And there'll be some prayer partners in the back this morning who'd love to pray with you. But can I encourage you? The storm you're in today doesn't last forever. And the storm you're in today, God's got a plan. And if you think on those terms, okay, God, help me to learn the lesson quickly and get out of this storm. Put the umbrella away and let me help someone else. Then you can withstand the the winds and the rain a little better. Let's pray. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. 
If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithclamath.com. Make sure if you haven't already to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.